Hello and welcome to Rewildology, the podcast that explores conservation, travel, and rewilding the planet. I'm your host, Brooke Mitchell, conservation biologist and adventure traveler. When you think of Australia, what are the first wild images that come to mind? Surely vivid images of the Great Barrier Reef, vast desert and bushland, kangaroos, and flightless birds flash before you. I'm sure you also saw an image of Australia's most famous animal, the koala. With an animal as well known as the koala, I have to ask, how much do you actually know about the species? Is their reputation as lazy animals warranted? Why do they feed almost exclusively on toxic eucalypt leaves? How do they find each other during the breeding season? Do their populations differ from one region to another? What does the future look like for this most iconic of species? You probably have a guess for each question, but how do you know for sure the answer? I know I personally had a long list of stereotypical views about koalas and have my own guesses for each question, but now I can confidently say that I'm a borderline koala expert after reading a new book just released called Koala, A Natural History and an Uncertain Future. And the author of this book is the guest of today's episode. Today, we are sitting down with Danielle Claude, PhD, conservation biologist and author. After leaving Oxford with a fresh PhD in hand, Danielle decided to use her education and communication skills to become a science writer. Since then, she's written several books about all sorts of topics, but felt inspired to write a comprehensive story about the well-known but commonly misunderstood koala. While there are countless children's books about koalas, previously there weren't any in-depth, scientifically sound books about the species, and Danielle has filled this important gap with her book, Koala. Danielle and I discuss the inspiration for her book, misconceptions about koalas and the biological reasonings for their behaviors, top threats koalas are facing, the devastating black summer fires of 2019, the difficulties of writing a book during a pandemic and subsequent lockdowns, tips to take your scientific communication to a new level, and her hopes for the future. Also, I want to remind you of the Rewildology listener meetup. I'm working on the next big phase of the show, and I want to hear from you. I'm planning an hour of picking your brain, hearing what you love about the show, what can be improved, ideas for future episodes, listening to your stories, of course, because I love that, and enjoying a tasty beverage together. And of course, don't worry, joining this meetup won't cost you anything, just an hour of your time. The meetup will happen via Google Meets at 6 p.m. Eastern, 3 p.m. Pacific on May 16th. If you'd like to join, please let me know by emailing me at hello at rewildology.com or send me a DM on Instagram or Twitter at rewildology. I can't wait to meet all of you. Please join. <laughs> Open invite. All right, everyone, please enjoy this conversation with Danielle. Well, hi, Danielle. Thank you so much for sitting down with me on the total opposite side of the world to talk about a very beloved species. But before we get to, you know, just koala one-on-one, -on -one, the conservation, all the fantastic meat and potatoes of today's conversation, I have to ask, because I am always so curious to hear the answer. Why? koalas of all the australian species that you could have dedicated your time to you decided koalas so what's the story behind your connection to the species sure thanks brooke it's lovely to be here um i guess one of the very simple reasons i was interested in koalas is because i live in an area that's quite full of koalas so you know, we all know koalas are pretty rare outside Australia. You don't, you don't see them very often, not even in very many zoos. And even in Australia, they're quite rare. So most Australians won't have seen one in the wild. But um, oh. just the other night, I was woken up by the sound of a koala bellowing in the trees outside my bedroom. Um, quite out of season, I should add. But nonetheless, he was, he was very enthusiastic about it. 
And I guess that that's one of the reasons what that got me interested in koalas was why are they so abundant where I live in the Adelaide Hills, which is on the south coast of Australia, sort of right in the middle, whereas in other parts of Australia, like the east coast of Sydney and, and Queensland and all those places, they're really quite rare and, and have been declared, um, you know, endangered um, and potentially going extinct in areas. So that was one of the great mysteries about them. Other than that, I guess koalas, you know, everybody knows koalas. Everybody is familiar with them. Most people love them. You know, they're, they're quite adorable and, and um, they're, they're the most iconic Australian animal, I guess. But I'm, I'm not sure we know much about them. And I have to say, when I first started writing this book, my, my husband said to me, you know, you sure you're going to be able to write a book on koalas? You know, there's, they're pretty simple. There's not much to know. <laughs> And it turns out there is actually a lot to know about koalas. They're really, really complicated. So that was a real re revelation to me. So what did you do before the book? I mean, I'm, I'm sure we'll, we'll get into how long this wonderful book took you to write, but there was a before the book. So what did you do? Yes, there, there is a before the book. So my background, I, I've trained as a, in conservation biology. So my PhD is in conservation biology which I actually did in the UK at Oxford, but I, I'm, you know, came back when I came back to Australia, I somehow became a science writer. So my main interest has been in science communication and I've been a writer for a very long time now. Um, so I was actually working on some quite different books before Koala. I was working on a, a little biography of a paleontologist, so a little a kid's book, um, which is about, you know, why people become scientists and, and what, what their childhood was that made them become interested in science. So that was a great little project. So that's That's wonderful. Yeah, yeah. It's a, a series called STEM Stars and it's all about Australian um, Australian scientists. So it's it's a lovely little series. Yeah. <laughs> and the one I wrote was on John Long, who's a paleontologist so and, and also a friend of mine. So so that was that was a great project and the one before that was on um the first woman who sailed the world where she was a french um natural history collector who sailed around the world on on one of the early french scientific expeditions uh so on the bougainville voyage so so i had a really diverse interest and koala was was very different from my previous books but in actual fact quite close to where i first started which was in mammal ecology Mm -hmm. So it was almost like this was full circle for you. It's like the other things were almost a steer away <laughs> to come back to a species that was in your backyard, essentially, that you loved so much. That's right. And, and it's a real pleasure to be able to work on a project that's explicitly about the animal. I, I guess when, when you're writing stories for people, people like to hear about themselves. So they like to hear the human story very much. And and it's always a bit of a struggle I find in writing, especially about conservation biology, when you really want to talk, tell the story of the, of the species and the animals. And, and I tried really hard to do that with koala, really pin it back to the koala story from there as much as I possibly could from their perspective, which is, of course, really difficult because koalas can't write books, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah. And as we'll get into... I really appreciate that you did that because I am a big av advocate for telling the human story, but I've also come to find that the species that I'm most interested in and that I work most closely to, one, they've been reported on in so many ways that there probably is not much more that we could possibly know about them, and they're extremely conflict-ridden. So to remember the human side is really important. But one thing that your book taught me, and we, we can actually start to get into this right now, is there are so many misconceptions about koalas that I didn't even I didn't even realize were misconceptions. I was just so ignorant and naive about the species, just because that's just what we've always said about this is how koalas live. This is how they are. This is their behavior. This is what they do. And your book definitely showed me otherwise. So could you talk a little bit more about that? Maybe give us like the koala 101 about them, that why they're unique. They even like went through their natural history and their evolution and, and all kinds of stuff. But could you just almost spew on us koalas and the, the one on 101 on them? Yeah, well, I, I guess um, 
you know, you know, the, the perception that koalas are very simple and, and straightforward animals. Um, and I mean, koalas are one of the most well-known and, and famous conservation species in the world and actual fact. So there is a, there is a lot of politics around koalas, um, and that, you know, they receive a huge amount of conservation money. Um, and, and, you know, they they are iconic in, in the sense that, you know, a bit like being the poster child for conservation in some ways for, for, you know, um, like a panda or, or polar bears or that, those sorts of iconic animals. So, so it is a really big issue in conservation. And, and of course it's confusing for a lot of biologists because biologists will say, well, koalas aren't as a species anywhere near endangered. Uh, they, they are, um, actually exceedingly common in the Southern forests of Australia but they are endangered and seem to be going extinct in the east coast forest to the north so uh, which is where people are worried about them so there's this kind of complication around around koalas and i guess i'm very wary of the of the, the stories we tell about species and and well actually any stories it's it's part of the thing i like to do with my books is to really unpack what what are the stories we tell why do we tell those stories and what's, what's, what's the truth, what's real, what, what, what's it got an evidence base for it. So, so I'll often want to go back to the archives and double check everything. Um, but in the case of koalas, I had to use a real wide range of scientific evidence to try and unpack them. So that's, you know, I start the book in the fossil history because I think we see koalas as this singular species, unlike anything else. Uh, but it's always useful to know what their family history is. And if we go back into the fossil record, we find there's a whole range of different species that extinct that koalas are related to. And we get a much better sense of what kind of an animal they yeah, are right. if you look at what their close relatives are. Uh, so that, so they're not as singular. I mean, they, they are still pretty singular, but they're not as isolated as we think of them. And, it, and it's important to try and get away from that idea. Well, I mean, look at that idea about them being the last of their kind, because we, we have a tendency to blame animals for their own extinction. You know, we'll, we'll say like the panda is, is, um, stupid, maladapted, has a really dumb diet and is going extinct because it can't breed properly. Um, and we have the same narrative with koalas in some ways, even though we, we can love it to death. We will still say it's, it's slow, it's stupid, it has a dumb diet, it, you know, it eats toxic leaves and it's doomed to extinction. So this idea of being doomed to extinction has been going on for as long as uh, Europeans and settlers have been talking about koalas. And I don't think that's true at all because they're actually extremely resilient animals. They have bounced back from extinction at least twice, near extinction, of course, at least twice that we know of. Uh, and once very recently with, with hunting of koalas in Australia, uh, and pre before that with the great megafauna extinction that wiped out a lot of the ice age animals. So, so koalas suffered from a huge extinction event, near extinction event then too. So, you know, they're a really, so, so they're a really resilient species. And I, and I think that was the interesting thing for me to look at is, is how that came about. And in the process of unpacking that, of course, I unpacked a whole heap of really amazing information around how koalas are so well adapted for um, the trees they live in specifically. So the co-evolution of eucalypts and koalas uh, is a really incredible story. And I think that really, really helps us to understand exactly what's going on with them, why they're difficult to breed, why they need so much space, um, all of those sorts of things. Yeah, I cause I was not aware like just how picky they are, and you went into fantastic depth of uh, depth blah, blah, depth about their microbiomes and how specific they are, and having to get um oh what what did you call it that special almost like poo formula that babies need from their mother to get the biome to be able to even digest these leaves. But yeah, for maybe those of us that don't know much about eucalyptus, the, the family that these that these koalas love to eat, could you maybe explain a little bit more about them and why are they 
so difficult to eat and why is the koala like pretty much one of the only species that feeds almost exclusively on them yeah yeah so typically when we think about eucalyptus trees we think of them as just a singular tree you know singular type of tree the eucalyptus but of course they're a really large and diverse family of tree or group of trees there's a, you know almost 900 species and subspecies of eucalypts most of them are from Australia, so they're very, very specific to Australia. Although, of course, everybody's familiar with them because they've been one of the most, um, they're, they're sort of a reverse colonizer. We've, we've actually sent eucalypts off into the world uh, and they are one of the most widespread planted trees now um, elsewhere, hardwood certainly in the world. So, you know, so most people are familiar with them in, in America, in China, in Europe. Um, all those sorts of places, and and you know they, they are very characteristic. The, the oh, leaves yeah, some. are quite thick. And just I raced outside this morning to go and grab some leaves <laughs> off the trees because I'm surrounded by eucalypts. And and that's the interesting thing, of course, that you know we think of eucalypts as being something strange and unusual, but in Australia they are the dominant forest. So so our great forest estate is nearly always dominated by eucalypts. Um, so so they're a really really common type of tree. But they do have these very tough, these are actually regrowth, so they're a little bit softer than many of them are, but they're quite leathery, hard leaves. Um, and if, if you know, if you um, crush them, they've got a very powerful smell because they're full of the eucalypt oils. So eating them takes quite a, um, quite a it's quite a struggle to eat them. They're, they're very fibrous and mammals can't digest cellulose and lignin in plant matter themselves. So most... Uh, most herbivores have really complex stomachs to to in order to digest this very fibrous plant material. So that's whether they're eating grass or or leaves or, or whatever it is they're eating. So koalas don't have really complex stomachs, but what they do have is a um, really large. It's, it's called a cecum, and it's the equivalent of the appendix in humans. So while it, our appendix is very residual and it's only about the size of your thumb. The koala cecum is almost two meters long. So it's a huge thing for a small animal <laughs> to have. Yeah. And it, it's like a, a, basically what it's it is like a pouch. So a, a, a big pocket in the digestive system that's full of a microbial soup. And it's the microbes that herbivores use to digest the cellulose and lignin in the leaves. And, and in grass as well. So the, the koala chews up all the leaves, the, the fine particles are diverted into the cecum, into this soup where they'll stay for several days a week to be have all the nutrients digested and be um, broken down by the bacteria and, and other microbes. And the, the large particles will be swept, you know, through the normal digestive system and, and, it, it, and um, popped out the other end. <laughs> so... <laughs> So, so that's the basic thing. But then, of course, there are the toxins that are um, in the leaves. So koalas have to have a way of, of dealing with those toxins. And, and a lot of the toxins in eucalypts actually make mammals feel nauseous. So they, they create nausea in the animals. So they'll eat a little bit of it and then they'll say, oh, no more of that, thank you. So koalas deal with this in part with their liver. They have a supercharged liver that's quite large and complex um, in its structure. And it seems to have a double dose of genes for removing toxins from eucalypts. And they're so good at removing um, toxins that they're actually also really good at removing things like medicine from their system. So it's really hard to treat koalas for diseases because not only do they have this liver that removes all the toxins, but of course also some of those medicines will also really disrupt their microbial system, which ends up meaning that they don't eat. So... Um, a good example of that is the treatment of chlamydia, which koalas suffer from quite a lot, uh, particularly on the East Coast. And a normal dose of, for chlamydia in humans would be a three-day dose of antibiotics. Uh, in koalas, that will be a 30-day dose to, to clear Crazy. up that disease. So, you know, that, that just gives you an idea of how powerful that, that liver is. So, yeah, getting, getting hold of all those nutrients in leaves is a really tight struggle they've got really complex proteins that are really hard to extract and this this is something that was a real struggle for me to come to grips with it's not my area of expertise but you know the 
that sometimes they can actually, when they eat some of the leaves on some species of eucalypts, they can eat the leaves and actually end up with less nutrition than they started with. So it's so hard for the, the leaves are so complex and resist being processed so much that they actually extract nutrients out of the koala rather than the other way around. So it's really, really important that the koala gets it right, which ones they eat. Um, so for that reason, koalas only eat about 70 species of eucalypts uh, across Australia, and any one koala will only eat between four and 10 species that are found in their area. And it's quite probable that their microbiome is specifically adapted to those individual species that it's familiar with. And as you mentioned, they get those microbes, they, you know, they're not born with the microbes. They don't have them in their gut when they're young, when they're milk feeding. But at some point as they're developing, the mother will actually evacuate her cecum. So she'll empty the, a, a big dose of the contact microbial soup from her cecum and it comes out as this runny green pap and the baby koala laps that up, absolutely loves it. It's, it's a big, disgusting mess when this happens, <laughs> um, but that inoculates the koala, that baby, the joey, with the right microbiome for its forest, the forest that it lives in. So it means that as soon as it gets that, it can start eating gum leaves, which before it, it doesn't eat them at all. It have a bit of a chew and a play with them, but it won't eat them. So it's, it's a really fascinating system, this way the mother inoculates the baby with exactly the right um, biome. And, and you might think that's a strange and a bit disgusting thing to do, but, but in actual fact, we're increasingly understanding that microbiomes are really important for our own health, for probably most animals' health. And even in humans, there's an element of fecal contamination during the birth process that gives us our gut biome as well. So we do a, a very similar thing. And, and humans that have lost their gut biome through massive antibiotic courses and things are also inoculated and in, not in the same way, but um, also <laughs> they do the same thing in hospitals. They don't like talking about it very much, but, <laughs> but the same process is used in humans as well. Yeah, I come from a family of all ladies. And so the, the whole childbirth process, you know, I'm very used to that. And, you know, having a vaginal birth versus a C-section, they've come to show that there are consequences for the baby. So, yeah, I'm not I'm not surprised that this is how a baby Joey would get the proper microbiome to the ecosystem that it lives in, because how else would it get it? Like, how else are those that very special soup essentially that is the species that will break down the leaves that they eat you know how else are they going to get that so it just makes sense that it would come from the mother in a interesting way i'm sure you've seen it and i'm sure it's a very interesting to see yeah but i think so this this that starts to dabble on their behavior and you did again a wonderful job just breaking myths about their behavior that they're this just slow lazy species and that's not the that's not actually the true story you know so could you talk a little bit about that maybe why did they get that that reputation and i guess is is it true you know mm -hmm. what what is the maybe a normal day of a koala like and yeah how should we look at them and, the, and what they do yeah i guess I guess the the interesting thing about koalas is that there's there's quite a lot of quite pervasive underlying myths that we tell about koalas. Obviously, we get the sort of Reddit end stream of the story where you know people will say they're stoned on the eucalypt leaves that they <laughs> they you know they're drugged out <laughs> because it's true they are sleepy and they they generally are slow moving. So that they sleep up to ninety percent of their time. You know, a koala's day active day could be not much more than half an hour. So, you know, they, they pack everything into a short time frame. So, so that is true. But, but I guess we, that, that's also led to this idea that because they sleep a lot um, because of the food they eat. So there's this prevailing thought that they, they, they sleep a lot and they're slow because their food is low nutrition. They're not getting very much um, nutrition out of their food supply. Therefore, they have to reduce their energy consumption. Therefore, they sleep a lot. And this has also led to the belief that they have a small brain, that this brain has actually shrunk because of the low level of nutrition in their food. 
Now, when I came, you know, when I was thinking about this story, I was thinking, that doesn't really make sense to me. You know, we have a lot of animals that sleep a lot. I've got a cat and it spends 90% of its day asleep. Same. Um, um, you know, dogs spend a lot of time asleep. Typically, the type of animals that spend a lot of time asleep have a high nutrient diet. So they sleep because they can. They, they, you know, they get their food and then they just chill out for the rest of the time. So I thought, well, if this is a low nutrient problem, why is the animal not eating more? Uh, now, it, it's true. It could be because of the amount of time it takes to digest the food. But nonetheless, when I looked into it, I realized that koalas consume pretty much the same biomass of leaves as an, any other low nutrient herbivore does, like the same body size goat or sheep will eat about the same amount of food. So I couldn't, and I, and I also saw, well, if it's something to do with digestion, you'd end up with a bigger animal so that it's got more capacity to store leaves. So biologically and evolutionarily, it just didn't make sense to me that they would sleep because they're low in nutrients. And they do seem to get exactly the same nutrient value out of what they eat as any other animal. Le the gum leaves are low nutrient, but so is grass, you know? <laughs> All it's no better or worse, not as toxic, but it's probably even harder to digest. So it made me realize that what's going on with the koalas is that they're sleeping. They're sleeping because they can. They, they get up, a, they find an appropriate tree that's got lots of food for them. They climb up the tree, they settle in, um, they eat their fill, and then they sit around and digest. So why wouldn't you have a sleep? I guess the, re we, the thing I wanted to think about then was, well, why do other herbivores not sleep? Of course, herbivores on the ground are vulnerable to predation and their response to predation is to run away. So they have to be awake and alert to watch for predators. So koalas have a different predator strategy. Their predator strategy is to sit quietly and inconspicuously in the trees and hope no one notices them. And they actually are really hard to spot in trees. And they're, you know, they have predators, but it's, they're not quite as exposed to predators as animals are on the ground. So koalas are vulnerable to predators on the ground when they come down from their trees. So dogs are one of their major, you know, predators. But once they're up the tree, they're pretty safe. So they're basically chilling out because they can and, and relaxing. So, so that, that, I think, unpacks a lot of those things. The other issue about their brain size is also a myth. They've, I think that what happened was people would, doing brain measurements on pickled specimens and mm. the, the tissue had shrunk um, and, and koala brains do, do shrink when they're, when they're preserved. If we look at recent specimens, the brain is pretty much completely normal for their body size and there's also been MRI scans done now on living animals and it, the brain is just a normal size brain. Might have a slightly more, um, you know, cerebral fluid around the around the. The brain possibly is a protection from falling, but, and they do have quite sturdy skulls. I've got one here, actually. So this is, this is the koala skull. Oh, how and cool. <laughs> and it, and it is quite, it's a quite a solid, solid little skull, but it is absolutely normal sized for its, its body size. Um, and the brain cavity is as well. So, so yeah, there's, there's nothing that, um, unusual about that. So. But that, that myth actually is not just in um, popular commentary. It actually does pop up in, in the scientific literature as oh, well. Oh, really? So, so it's just something people haven't given a great deal of comparative thinking to it, to think why do, pe why do animals sleep? What makes sense in terms of evolution? And I think, I think that's worth having a closer look at because it does impact on our concept of, you know, koalas. The other thing, koalas are being, as, as being stupid. Um, right. I think, you know, I'm really wary about quick comments about intelligence in animals because usually as humans, when we're looking at in, we talk about intelligence, we're usually thinking about things like us. We're, we're the sort of the stand, the gold standard for intelligence um, in our own perceptions. And so we're unlikely to appreciate the cognitive strategies that other animals use in their environment. And to me, Intelligence isn't about our kind of language, communication, problem solving, creativity, any of those things. It's more about flexibility, cognitive flexibility, the ability to come up with new strategies and behaviors in response to um, changing environments. And 
although koalas might be slow and they might not do a lot in a day, they're not very busy. So it takes a long time for you to collect data on koala behavior. They are very flexible. And we know that because everywhere we look at koalas in different parts of the country, they behave differently. Uh, so, so they're, they're actually doing different things in different places. And, and I think that's really interesting. We don't, we don't really know how koalas find their way through a forest. Um, how do koalas know which trees to go to, which trees to go back to, which trees not to, which trees to avoid? They have a huge range. It takes one koala needs actually a, a forest the size of an average sports field to support it. So that's a single koala per that, that large area. And so they're traveling across big dis distances and there's lots of questions about how they navigate that. You know, are they, are they really moving randomly through the environment? I don't think so. I think that would be quite unusual for an animal to do that, but maybe, maybe they are, but, but those are the sorts of questions I think are worth looking at more in terms of koalas rather than just assuming they're, they're stupid and operating by chance. Yeah, I, that is the perfect example. So I just returned from Tanzania where I had a wonderful two week long safari. Also met up with my team that's over there. So I work in conservation tourism. That's what I do professionally. And the difference in behavior was incredible. Just like you said, I mean, I watched firsthand multiple herbivores get eaten and sit <laughs> by big cats with big teeth. Um, not just cats, but also, you know, hyenas and all kinds of stuff that, that, their whole goal is to feed themselves. So the difference in behavior, that makes total sense. And as you were saying that, that I had an immediate conservation question that came into mind it is how often are they coming onto the ground? And when they do, is that when they are the most vulnerable? And if that is, is that happening now at a higher rate? I'm assuming that, um, you know, deforestation and habitat loss is probably just as big of an issue as it is in Australia, as it is most parts of the world right now. So is that one of the biggest threats that's happening with koalas or, mm -hmm. or what have you seen with maybe coming down to the ground? Um, and how has that translated into the risk that they are putting themselves into? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's definitely probably, um, they are definitely at their most vulnerable on the ground and they, they probably, that's always been their greatest predation risk. I mean, they, they are taken by powerful owls, um, the, the big owls that, that we get in Australian forests. Uh, I they, love owls. I'm sure wedge-tailed eagles, well, they're known to be taken by wedge-tailed eagles. We have quite a lot of big, big predatory birds. But their major threat is almost certainly when they're on the ground. Um, and particularly mothers with joeys on their back are extremely vulnerable. So, uh, and, and if you think about it, that's probably one of the biggest impacts on population is, is the breeding rate for, for koalas. So if you have a predation that's targeting mothers on the ground, when they're moving between trees, that's going to have a significant impact on controlling populations or limiting populations. So. So that's a really interesting feature. And yes, you're right. Um, changes in habitat are also having a big impact. So we've got increasing uh, deforestation, uh, increasing uh, habitat fragmentation. So koalas have to travel between patches of, of forest at times or they're restricted to a single forest. All the, the forests are also being degraded. So it's quite common to get clearance through the forest, uh, you know, removal of the understory, those sorts of things, all of which forestry changes. So the types of trees change, all those sorts of things are resulting in koalas being on the ground more, having to travel longer distances that are unsafe. Of course, the, one of those major fracturing factors in their habitat are roads and cars are a huge um, mortality impact on koalas. We, we get a lot of koalas being hit by cars because they're trying to cross the roads and the freeways. Um, and we, we keep putting our roads across their roads. Um, so, so the paths they need to, to follow are being cut off. And then we've got development. Um, koalas like to live in similar areas to humans. So, or vice versa, really. So humans are moving into those fertile river valleys, forested river valleys, cutting down the trees and building houses. And we get, get a lot of, um, 
real estate developments uh, that don't take into account the needs of the local koala population. Very obvious, often advertise the properties as being, you know, you get koalas in the trees, isn't it lovely? <laughs> oh, what? So we chop down all the trees, there's no more koalas. So, you know, it's really important that we look at those particular things we're doing um, and, and target those as strategies, you know, not removing any remaining native forest logging. Native forest logging and clearing is meant to have been stopped in Australia decades ago, and yet it's still happening because there's too many exemptions and there's not enough, um, you know, checking and regulation on, on what's actually going on. And also, you know, making sure that development happens in an appropriate way, that key koala habitats are protected, that feed trees are protected, all of those sorts of things. And particularly protecting forests along river systems is really important because the trees that koalas feed on best and probably the trees they need to breed are the ones that are along river systems where the trees are very lush, they're not producing as many toxins, so they're much better for, for the animals to, to reproduce with. Yeah. And my next thing, um, so it was the perfect segue to start talking about the threats and obviously the habitat loss is a big one for multiple different reasons. Their food is being destroyed. They are coming into conflict with humans in various ways, roads. That's a huge problem too. And your chapter 19, um, which is the sex disease and genetic diversity chapter, which I found very fascinating. It seems like it's also hitting on this topic as well. Um, and you, you, you mentioned it a second ago with chlamydia. I had no clue that this was a problem that koalas face. And just to read that part where you interviewed somebody and they were, I'm pretty sure, and they were talking about how a koala could be in so much pain that they would literally cry as they were just yeah. trying to urinate because the infection had gotten so bad. So where does this fall in the threat category? Has chlamydia been always a part of what koalas have dealt with? Has it gotten worse over the years? Is this something that is a big concern for conservationists uh, over as we're looking long term on keeping our koalas here? So yeah. Maybe where does chlamydia specifically and then maybe disease and like this sex genetic diversity question overall fit into this, this story? Yeah. So um, chlamydia and the, the major diseases of, chlamydia, of koalas, I guess, are, are chlamydia and retroviruses. So um, chlamydia, you know, we're familiar with as a sexually transmitted disease. It causes pink eye, so it causes the, the, the eyes to become really red and inflamed and it irritates the urogenital tract as well and that becomes extremely red and inflamed. The, the, the animals can go blind, they can go, uh, they certainly become infertile and it's a very painful condition. Retroviruses cause a, an immune, immune disease like AIDS, like koala AIDS, we can call it. So that obviously makes chlamydia and all the other diseases far worse. The issue of where that came from is, is really interesting. Retroviruses are a part of koala biology. They have a number of different retroviruses, probably just like a lot of other species. Um, and they probably impact in waves and we're currently undergoing a wave that's moving down the, down the east coast of Australia from the north. Chlamydia, like in humans, there's a number of different types of chlamydia floating around. Koalas may well have had a type of chlamydia already, but they may also have gotten the sheep chlamydia that came with European settlement. So, so we're not sure what's having the biggest impact on them, which, but, you know, we used to think there was just one type of chlamydia. Now we realize there's lots of different types. So, um, it's quite likely that those things have become worse for koalas recently. Obviously disease is one of those tricky things. We focus a lot on koala disease. The bulk of research into koalas is into their diseases, but we don't know if they're a symptom or a cause really of the problems koalas face. Because we know that diseases become worse when animals are in stress, a stress condition, when they've got a disruptions to their habitat, climate change, all of those things will exacerbate disease. So I'm inclined to think of these problems as a, as a symptom of the difficulties koalas face. And while I think it's great to be working on vaccines and, and they are trialing koala vaccines, ultimately, I think if you've got a strong, healthy koala population, it's probably going to be more resistant to those diseases. And we see that, for example, in, in South Australia, where I live, 
we have had a, cl a chlamydia free population and that's part of the reason why the southern koalas have done so well because they've been descended from a population that didn't have chlamydia and when you get chlamydia introduced to those populations sometimes Sometimes they, it has a bad effect and wipes out the population of koalas, but in other cases, the koalas just don't seem to suffer the same symptoms. So we get koalas here with chlamydia, but they're nowhere near as sick as the ones in other areas. So it's a complex relationship between those two things. Uh, and I think we still have to look at the environmental conditions and making sure you've got a really strong, healthy population and and with, with the support, the habitat that they need to support them through those things as well, as well as trying to fix the, the end result in the, in the disease burden. Yeah. And I think one of the underlying themes that I'm hearing you talk about that you went into depth in your book and one issue that I didn't truly have appreciation for until I lived in a fire zone. Um, so the big fires, I think, what was it called? The Black Summer? Is that what it was okay. called? Um, the Black Summer fires that completely devastated Australia. And again, I didn't realize, because at the time I worked for a, um, a different company and we were just building an amazing Australian wildlife uh, tour and almost the entire itinerary burned down. And just to see what happened what blew my mind and it wasn't until very recently um in Colorado that we had like a an urban fire to for me to really truly understand how scary it is when a fire like that comes close to you um, and i you reading about it i mean you're talking about your daughter asking you like mom how close is that fire to us and do we have to pack do we have to leave and to know that what happened the statistics that you listed in your book for the wildlife that unfortunately perished in that. So let's talk about these fires for a little bit. What happened? Why were they so catastrophic? And how were the koalas populations affected, I guess? And I mean, I guess maybe even wildlife as a whole. So what, what happened in the 2019, 2020 black summer fires? Um, and, and I guess what was the aftermath of that? Yeah, so I've done quite a lot of work on bushfires um, in the past. So I've written a book on the history of Australian bushfires as well. So this is an area I'm really familiar with. And and Australia is a very fire-prone continent. And part of that um, is exacerbated by the eucalypt forests because the eucalypts are highly flammable and they have adapted to this fire-prone environment. Um, so some of their drought adaptations allow them to survive fires. So even though the forests are burnt, many of the trees will regenerate. They'll, they'll reshoot from epicormic shoots under their bark and from lignotubers um, underground. So, so the trees recover, which is quite remarkable. So, so the, a lot of aspects of Australian um, biology are adapted to cope with fire. But I guess the problem is that we have disrupted the environment so much that um, there are mu that much smaller pockets of forest left. So when fires come through, they tend to have a, um, a disproportionate impact, of course, on the remaining vegetation. They, they, don't, tend to, they don't tend to burn through a, um, human habitation. They don't burn into the cities or <laughs> places like that. They burn less severely on open grassland and farmland. So the, the forests are particularly vulnerable to fire, and that's where the bio, you know, most of the species are. So it's going to have a disproportionate effect on them and particularly koalas because koalas can't um, move out of the way easily. So I did have a bushfire come through. Um, there's a big reserve to the south of, the, of my property and a, a fire was came through and burnt through that whole reserve and right up to the edge of my property and, and burnt the trees. In fact, the, these, these leaves that I mentioned earlier, they regrow from the bushfires. So oh. that's from a tree that was burnt, which is why it's shooting at the base. So, and, and when those fires came through, it was really characteristic because we, we had, um, we had the, the big birds came through, the big cockatoos all came sweeping overhead, heading out of the fire zone, uh, ahead of the fire. 
Then we had a wave of tiny little birds all twittering in alarm and like this big cloud of tiny birds flew overhead. Then we had the kangaroos come bounding through. They, ca- they came down our driveway and across into the bush behind us. So there's this big pounding mass of kangaroos coming through. But the koalas can't do that. They are slow moving. Their tendency is to sit in the tree and stay put. Uh, and I hope, you know, I guess in many cases, fires are just going to be light fires. They're, they're like cool burns that might just trickle through in the undergrowth and the koalas are fine up in the trees. But in a, in a hot fire, that's not the case. They basically get incinerated. So, you know, their only hope is to try and find a, a gully or a creek line that they can shelter in, which, which they often do as well. So we would have lost quite, nobody knows exactly how many koalas we lost in the reserve. It could have been as many as 10,000 koalas wow. just, in a, just in a little reserve behind me. Even worse, though, was the fire on Kangaroo Island, which was actually, which is an, an island in South Australia that where koalas were put as part of a, res, a safety population. So they were set there as a, as a nature reserve um, and a way of protecting the population when it was, it, when it was in decline after hunting, well, humans had hunted them to near extinction in the South. In fact, they had wiped them out in South Australia. They were completely extinct. But that population had recovered really well and was one of the biggest populations in Australia. And um, after the fires, which burnt through all of the reserve, um, the forested areas of the island, so that the island is famous for its reserves, and all of that forest area was burnt, and some 40,000 koalas died in that fire. So it just shows how even a hugely successful population like that, that was established to protect a species, can be lost in, in a single fire. So that's why they're so vulnerable to fire. Then we had all the East Coast fires, which, which were not Australia's biggest, I should say. Lots of people say they are, but that's probably just because they happen on the East Coast and that's where all the people live. Of course, we've had bigger fires than that in Australia. But they did happen over a long period of time and over a wide area, you know, lots of different places. So, th- so they were certainly very significant in that sense. It was their, their um, extent in terms of how long they went for. Over, over so many different areas that was quite striking and you know fires are becoming more severe and more frequent with climate change so, so that's a, a well-established fact uh, and we can expect that to happen more often and of course the more frequent the fires are the harder it is for the forest to recover so it's likely to change the nature of the forests and it's likely to change it towards species that are more fire resistant um, and what, the impact that has on the trees for koalas to feed on, whether they're going to become more toxic. Um, you know, it's a, it's a fine balance. It'd be very easy for the forest to become completely unpalatable for koalas, which, which would be devastating. So, so those are the, the problems we have. One of the good things I think out of Black Summer was that's the first time I have um, noticed and I have looked at the history of fires in Australia that wildlife has been really up the top of people's concerns. Generally people are only concerned about the human impact after fires but this time the concern over wildlife generally, koalas in particular, was just enormous and and I think, I mean I hope that's a good sign that people are actually realizing how we really do need to look after the natural landscape we have and the animals and plants we have and realizing the impact these these fires and and other things that are really being made worse by human activity um and and the impact that's having and and the risks that face that that our wildlife face because of that right yeah i'm sure every single person listening probably saw on social media like that photo of a koala in a complete burnt forest you know that was Mm -hmm. almost like the the poster child essentially of those fires. I mean, I vividly remember those, like I'm seeing one in my head right now. Mm -hmm. And one thing that, so I am what I like to call a realistic optimist. So everything we just listed was pretty doom and gloom, but that is the reality of the situation. These are all of the threats that our koalas are facing. And, and also, you know, just wildlife in general that inhabits their same ecosystem. So what, for the optimist side of me, what 
can we do or what is being done to ensure our koalas stay around? Like, is there conservation efforts that you really love that you you love to highlight or you love to talk about or um, anything like that? How are we as a group going to make sure that our koalas stay here for the foreseeable future? Okay. Look, I mean, co- the thing I think about koalas is that there's a, there's a huge amount of conservation money spent on koalas. Um, there's no denying that that they do attract massive amounts of money, as we saw in the in the Black Summer fires in the aftermath of that. There were huge sums of money sent to uh, for koala recovery. And look, it's absolutely completely understandable that people will want to rescue injured koalas and care for them. And koalas are the only species I can think of, certainly in Australia, that have their own dedicated hospitals and their own dedicated koala carers. No other species gets that attention. You don't get, you know, specialist kangaroo carers. They just go to the wildlife carers. So koalas get a lot of personalised attention. And I understand that people want to save them as individuals. I guess as a biologist, my interest is in saving them as a species um, rather than focusing so much on on the individuals although though I, I i don't i don't think that's a bad thing but but i think that, that the answers are different answers um and we do need to we do need to be looking at the things that are affecting their their habitat obviously the number one issue is climate change goes without saying the number two issue is land clearance and protecting forests and we do have to stop native logging We've known that for a long time. We've just got to stop doing it. It's an unviable industry that requires quite a lot of subsidies from the government anyway. So really, it's um, something we, sh- we shouldn't be um, investing in anymore. And plant- and replanting forests, we-, we need to be looking, rather than just at protecting the remaining forests, we actually need to be looking at expanding our forests. Where I live in the Adelaide Hills, we're down to 10% native vegetation coverage, which is quite terrible. We really need to get that up to 30% if we're not to lose more species. There's been m- modelling done that suggests we will lose bird species in particular if we don't increase the area of vegetation over the next few decades. So so that's a big thing. I guess koalas, though, do offer us a lot of hope. They are incredibly resilient. We hunted them to near extinction for fur to be sent to America and, and the UK, and they recovered from that in a remarkable translocation process so it's a great rewilding story koalas where you know they were put on an island a small population recovered they they had to be reshipped to new locations they were spread back through the southern um, forests and are now the biggest population of koalas in Australia so so that's been a huge success they can be they can recover um, and in, in Adelaide, they're actually moving into the city. So they're spreading down the hills, the forested hills, and making their way through the parks, the linear parks, into the city and living in people's backyards, which suggests that they are remarkably adaptable and flexible animals. So I think we've just got to try a little bit harder to work with them and think about what their needs are. We desperately need to protect what remaining trees we have, particularly in the city. We're still losing tree cover in our cities whereas we should be expanding it um so looking at ways of promoting that and and just making sure we're protecting the key habitat as i mentioned along the river systems none of these things are difficult we've just got to put our native resources our natural resources ahead of individual um, financial benefit which is basically the case it's a money versus nature story um, which I'm sure we're all familiar with, but we can only hope that a koala, an animal like a koala that everybody loves so much, can be the, the thing that heads this campaign and helps people to understand how important it is to protect protect our own environment as well as the environment we share with other species. Yeah, I love that you bring that up because there has been, and rightfully so, there's been a movement, I would say, in our field to get away from charismatic species. But I still feel like they have their place. And I feel like the koala follows underneath that umbrella that, yes, we do need to conserve more swaths of lands that are bigger than just an umbrella species covers, you know, like like that. But look how much attention they've gotten. You know, you you've listed how many millions of dollars were donated 
after the fires just for koalas alone because that species the world loves like it got on the world stage which you covered so well how it got on the world stage and and the amount of support it has garnered after something as devastating as the fires and for the next part i would like to switch a little bit more now to the narrative side of this and you wrote I had no idea that there was going to be a day that I read 300 pages about koalas, but I did. And I enjoyed every second of this book. So why, why, why did you do this? Why did, why did you, I can only imagine how much time this took you and how many hours, because you talk about the number of people you met with, the number of places you went to, you had to cave, they went caving for like the first time (laughs) and like crazy places to see artifacts, like what? So why why did you decide to write this book? Yeah, well, I, I guess, you know, as you said, I mean, conservation has been at the heart of my writing career, I guess, but I often find it a difficult subject to talk about for the reasons, reasons you mentioned that, you know, that you're inclined to be a bit doom and gloom. It's hard to be a conservation biologist and not be a little bit depressed about where yes. things are going. I often feel, you know, when I started in, conservation biology 30 years ago I thought it was the most important job in the world um surely this was something we were that this is whether what we were focusing on what we were really going to do something about and 30 years later I feel like we've actually gone backwards a little bit which is heartbreaking and so I really wanted I really want to do more work in that space to find a way I think I think we've we've tried to pretend this isn't happening for far too long and and how can we get people to pay more attention to it, you know, and I, and I think we're, we're struggling against, you know, there are so many more people in the world, how we support those people sustainably. Uh, and yeah, it, it's, it's, it's such a big question. Um, and particularly those of us who are so fortunate to live in really wealthy, high consumption societies, how we can live more sustainably in a way that's equitable for other humans and also for the wildlife is a big thing. So, so I guess I really wanted to move more into that area and, and find a way of telling that story in a way that was both honest, but also hopeful and gives people, um, a path that they can follow to, to help, you know, it, it, it's, it seems a bit overly simplistic to say, just plant a tree, but Honestly, that will do an awful lot of good. <laughs> it could just plant more trees um, and hopefully the right sorts of trees. But any tree is better than no tree. You know, just greening our environment, making sure that we're, we're doing something. Look for any opportunity to improve, improve the biodiversity of the area you live in. Pay more attention. Be more mindful of, of what's happening in your backyard or your local park. Um, how, how are we promoting the health of that environment? Uh, I think, you know, there's, if we don't need everybody to be a hundred percent brilliant at environmental protection, we didn't meet, we need, we don't need a few people to be great at environmental protection. We need a hundred percent of people to be a little bit good, a little bit better. So if we all can do our little bit, it will make an enormous difference. And, and I guess that's what I'm, what I'm aiming for with these books. And, and that's what I hope to uh, contribute to. Mm. Ah. Yes, I agree. I always say that imperfect all the time is better than perfect some of the time. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Is there a particular story from your from writing your book that really sticks out to you that you're like, oh my gosh, Brooke, there was this one time I kind of wrote about it, but you're not going to believe what it was like in person. Is there a, something that sticks out to you when I say that that you, you would love to share? Oh, look, I mean, it's, it's not explicit. It, it seems a bit strange now to think about it, but it was the caving story was, was yeah. just the one that stuck out for me. <laughs> one of the things about writing this book was that I wrote it in the middle of COVID. And I thought when COVID, you know, first started, I thought, oh, thank goodness I'm doing an Australian book that doesn't require overseas travel because that's going to be really problematic. And then all our state borders closed. So we weren't able to travel outside the state or even outside the area we lived in. Um, and of course I live in South Australia. Most of the koalas are on the East coast. So I couldn't go and talk to all the koala experts. So I was really having to look closer to home for, for, you know, 
experiences that I could do that apart from Zoom. And one of them was caving. I discovered that there was a great fossil cave um, for, for a giant koala, a fossil giant koala that was right close to, to where my grandparents used to live. So, so I went caving there and I'd never been caving. And I kind of had this idea that you just sort of wander into this cave and have a bit of a look around and, you know, the cavers might go off and do their cavey thing, but I, I just, you know, just take it easy. But no, no, cavers are very enthusiastic people. And if you offer to go caving with them, they are going to take you caving. So, so I was kitted out in helmets and overalls and boots and special bags and things. And, and I realized I was second in line and, and the guy, I thought he was going to go down this sort of big corridor, but no, he turned and went down this tiny little rabbit hole that I actually didn't think anybody could fit in. And I had no choice. I just had to follow suit. So I ended up diving down these tiny little tunnels. They were tunnels that actually connected the caves together. So they had dug them out. So they were just big enough for a person to squeeze through. So you're crawling along on, not even crawling, it's really wriggling on your belly um, with your arms outstretched. And you often have to turn, turn your head to fit your helmet through. <laughs> I'm just thinking to myself, there's no, I can't get stuck. Lots of other kids, school kids go through this cave. <laughs> and the only plausible reason why I should get stuck in this cave. <laughs> but it was certainly psychologically challenging not to, not to panic about it. Um, and, and also quite physically challenging as well. It's more exercise than I've ever done, I think. But, but it was a great experience and it really gave me a whole new appreciation for those things you read in scientific papers where they say cavers found this fossil. <laughs> There's a lot more to it than, than what's written in the scientific papers, I realized. Mm, yeah, I have not done that. Um, and I'm kind of an adrenaline junkie. And I really don't have issues with claustrophobia. But even that sounds a little like, ooh, I think I would have to prep myself mentally for that one. <laughs> like that one would be a little bit next level, even for somebody who almost says no to nothing. Like I, yeah. I'm always like, let's do it. Even then I was like, okay. Let's, let's actually weigh our options here. Should I do that? Yeah, no, no, it's, it's definitely a really strange experience, but, but it was really good. And it, and it did actually give me a great insight into, into koala prehistory and, and helped me to really understanding and understanding some of the underlying ecology in terms of climate and the role of surprisingly, the role of water, um, in koala evolution. So. So inspiration comes from the strangest places and, and it's always worth, even if it's going underground into the dark, it's always worth getting out into the natural environment um, to, to learn more about it in unexpected ways. And continuing down this challenging story theme. So one of my favorite questions that I ask everybody that comes on is, I'm well aware from my own journey and everyone that I sit down with that, and you've, you've kind of mentioned it briefly, touched on it a little bit here and there, that our journeys are not easy. They very rarely are a straight line. They're usually curving upside down in between one moment we think we're on top of the world, the next moment we're on the floor. And if you wouldn't, if you would be okay, is there a particular time in your journey so far that was struggle like a, a particular struggle for you that you've overcome that you would be okay sharing with us and, and what happened and how did you get through that time yeah that's that's an interesting question I I guess I guess it's a hard one because I feel so ridiculously privileged um in much of my in much of my life you know Apart from, you know, simply being a member of a very wealthy community in Australia, like in, like in the, you know, other Western parts of the world, you know, we're, we're really so lucky in so many things we've, we've got. Um, I guess the, the thing that concerns me is how well we're sharing those things and, and, and it's very hard when you're in a very privileged position to to be able to find a way of giving up some of the you know do you do you have to give up those things in order to make sure that others are, are getting the same benefits that you are and I think that's probably one of the things I really like about 
biology is that you're speaking for the, the things that can't speak for themselves and attempting to give a voice to them. But biology is a really difficult field to, to work in as well, because, because often you can't give a voice to those things you want to protect. And there's so many forces working against you. I think that's probably the most depressing thing I find and the most difficult challenge. And it's not one that goes away. I guess I have to think about it in a similar way as I do to bushfire preparation, um, which has been a big, obviously living in an environment where you're prone to bushfires and, you know, we've had several bushfires threaten our property. And recently we had a fire burn through our property. Fortunately, we, it went to, it, you know, it went around our property partly because it's well, pre well prepared. So <laughs> our bushfire preparation worked in that sense, but, um, you know, having to help my community members respond to those fires as well. My neighbor lost her house, another neighbor down the road, they lost, you know, their, in their eighties and they lost their home and all their possessions oh. and, and the trauma of that has been, you know, it, it doesn't ever go away. Um, so they've been really important life lessons for me in, in learning how to prepare for the worst, I guess, but still live in the hope for the best. And how to recover from things that are really not recoverable. Um, how to form something new out of the trauma that people have been through. And, and I do feel I've not been through that trauma, but uh, I, if I can help others with that process, that's, that's something that I feel very passionately about and have done quite a lot of work on. So, um, yeah, I'm not sure if that quite answers your question. Yeah, no, that's <laughs> good. I never know. No, I never know how people are going to an uh, answer that question, which is why I always love to ask it. Uh, yeah, and you have like this beautiful energy about you that I, you, I, I just feel the love and passion for what you do, and I, I'm the exact same way. Like I'm, I'm buzzing all the time. And continuing on speaking to those that are maybe prepping or or listening right now, um, you are an expert science communicator, and. As our world becomes more and more connected and I'm sitting down with more nature storytellers and communicators, is there one piece of advice or a thought or any kind of nugget that you could share with maybe me or anybody else that con considers themselves a science communicator? What should we know from somebody who has done it, who is published, who has been honing her voice for decades? What is something that I and everyone else can take away from our conversation? I guess I mean, one of the great challenges I find with science communication and nature writing, I guess, is, is that, you know, the, the worry that you're not reaching as many people as you'd like to, you know, <laughs> yeah. there's, there's always, you always have this sense that, you know, you're either preaching to the converted or you're, you're not reaching the people who need to listen to you. The people who need to listen to you don't don't want to listen to those stories, um, and and that's that's a really difficult thing. But I guess you you just have to you have to know that you only have to reach a few people to to make a difference. You know, I keep having to remind myself that if I make if I change one person's life through one of my stories, then that makes it worthwhile. That that in itself is enough. I'll use the bushfire example because the bush my bushfire book. That's probably been my least successful book, and yet it is my most important book. But I know that that book ultimately will save someone's life. Somebody will read that book, and it will make a difference to how they prepare for bushfires, what they expect from bushfires. And I, I hope that it will keep them safe one day. Perhaps it already has. I don't know. But, but that's the kind of thing you have, to, you have to cling on to. You're always, even if you're not reaching the mass audiences of the, la the latest science fiction, fantasy, historical fiction, whatever those, those books are, which everybody loves to read because it's a bit of escapism. But if, if, you can, if you can just tap into a handful of people, that makes it all worthwhile. And, and we all have to just keep, keep persisting with telling those stories and telling them in the most engaging and, and positive way we can to change behavior. Behavior change is incredibly hard to achieve, unbelievably hard. And the only way to do it is to do it persistently. I, I remember somebody talking to, interviewing somebody who was an expert in behavior change. And he said, you have to sell it like Coca-Cola all the time, every day for the rest of your life. 
everywhere you can. And, and I keep thinking about that. Sell it like Coca-Cola. That's what you have to do without the budget. <laughs> oh, that is such fantastic advice. And that's a great reminder for me and anybody else that has pretty much stepped up to the challenge of how can we get these voices out there that need to be told. And Danielle, oh my gosh, you are such an amazing person. And I'm so glad that you could sit down with me today. But please tell everybody, how can they get your book? How can they read it? How can they have a million tabs? Do you see I'm a tabber, like all of my <laughs> tabs of your book? How can they read it, learn so much more about your book and maybe even connect with you um, if they might want to ask more or anything like that? What's the best way to get a hold of all the things? Well, you can certainly check out the links on my webpage. So danielleclode.com.au. Don't forget the AU on the end. It, it should be in all good bookstores. So by all means, go into your bookstore, um, ask your local library to stock it. They'll all be able to get it in. It's available right across the English speaking world now. It's just been released in the UK. So yep. And, and it's also available in a different edition in Australia as well. So. So yeah, you, it, it should be readily available wherever you buy good books. Wonderful. And of course, I will have links to everything in the show notes. And so everyone's go to rewildology.com and uh, yeah, also grab a book. This episode is going to drop for Wild Koala Day. We're going to have make a whole week of it. So again, we'll be celebrating this for a while. But again, Danielle, thank you so much for coming on and speaking with me today and sharing your incredible story and knowledge with the whole Rewildology community. Thank you very much for having me. It's been fantastic. How much more knowledgeable do you feel about koalas now? <laughs> if you're out playing trivia and the host asks you a koala question, you should be able to give the correct answer on the first try after this episode. If you'd like to grab a copy of Koala or learn more about Danielle, be sure to check out the show notes at the website. I have all relevant links listed there. If you have a question about today's episode, please feel free to ask it in the Rewildologist Facebook group. As always, I want to thank you for being a part of the Rewildology community. If you'd like to support the show, some zero-cost ways include subscribing to the podcast on your favorite streaming app, leaving a rating and review to boost the algorithm, which will present the podcast to more listeners, signing up for the weekly Rewildology newsletter at the website, subscribing to the YouTube channel, and following the show on your favorite social media app. If you'd like to financially support the show and help us keep these stories on the airwaves, consider making a monetary donation at rewildology.com or purchase a piece of swag to show off your Rewildology love. At least 10% of proceeds from this podcast will be donated to our conservation partners. I'd also like to thank Focusrite for powering the podcast sound. If you'd like to see the Focus Right gear we use to record the show, head on over to rewildology.com and check out Nature Podcasting under the Resources tab. Until next time, friends, together we will rewild the planet. Hey, thanks again for listening to this episode of Rewildology. If you like what you heard, hit that subscribe button to never miss a future episode. Do you have a cool environmental organization, travel story, or research that you'd like to share? Let me know at rewildology.com. Until next time, friends, together we will rewild the planet.